All right. Good morning, everybody. I appreciate you joining us today. Uh, my name is Adam Slater, um, and welcome to our web, our monthly webinar presentation. This month, we're going to be discussing uh, the general state of ransomware in the world in 2021. Um, there's, a, a, I'm sure you guys have seen some news stories and some things uh, going on out there, and so we were hoping we could uh, get a couple minutes of your time today uh, to just kind of go over uh, a little bit more in depth, maybe of, of some of those uh, some of those developments and and um, some of those threats that are out there and, and one of the ways we can combat against them. Real quick, some housekeeping before we uh, fully get started here. Uh, as always, uh, your lines are on mute automatically. Um, we can only use the computer for audio. There's no dial in. Uh, as always, again, this webinar is being recorded and it can be played back on our website. So if you, um, uh, if you see something that you want to see again, you see something you want to share with somebody, you have to bounce halfway through this and you want to come back and finish it, you can absolutely do that. There's a chat window in the right hand side of your screen and you can use that to send some questions over to us and we will answer those for you at the end. So, um, as we all know, ransomware is still a huge threat. And it is uh, still something that uh, we are all very, very concerned with. So today, as I mentioned a moment ago, we want to go over some of those uh, changes, some of the, the growth of ransomware, and uh, and 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 talk a little bit more um, about you know, about uh, just ab about ransomware in general. So today we're going to cover uh, several things. The first thing that we're going to cover is we're going to cover the early signs of a ransomware attack. We're going to talk about who is really the target for a lot of ransomware. Um, spoilers, it's everybody, but uh, the percentages break down into some different uh, ways. And then uh, we're going to go into a live demo of the uh, Closeport email protection platform with uh, Madison, who will be uh, who is joining us. Um, and then finally, we will have a Q and A, and I will uh, uh, enumerate why there is a bridge between ransomware and closed port email as we move forward. So let's go ahead and get started. First off, let's talk about how big of a threat is ransomware these days and um, where do these attacks come from? So the vast majority of ransomware attacks actually start with, with a dry run of test attacks, which is really interesting. You don't necessarily see that a whole lot, but in ransomware, it's um, it's really the norm. These attackers will put together uh, a ransomware virus um, and it won't actually do anything other than get onto the network and spread. The reason for this is, is these attackers are iterating on their attack and perfecting it over time, uh, making sure that it won't get caught, making sure that it can spread quickly and effectively. Then once they're sure that the ransomware will execute properly, um, and lock down the network, they will update it so that it has the, um, uh, you know, so it has that capability and then they will put them out there. This is a staggering number of surprise even me that attacks have increased 97% give or take in the past two years. A, a, a great deal of that um, will come as no surprise to anybody is from the quarantining and the lockdown due to the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Um, lots of people were at home and it was a sudden shift in the nature of how we work and it was a sudden shift on the structure of our networks and we weren't all necessarily ready for that. Uh, so attackers basically uh, took advantage of that situation and really started pumping out the ransomware attacks. And um, the average bill for rectifying a ransomware attack is 1.85 million. Um, that's just the average bill. Um, we see a lot in, in, in our work uh, with smaller organizations, uh, you know, paying off a ransomware can, uh, depending on the size of the organization, it depends on how much the attackers are going to ask for. Um, a smaller organization, they know they're not going to get $1.85 million, so they'll ask for $50,000 and maybe they'll get that. Uh, the recent colonial pipeline ransomware attack, which I'm sure we're all familiar with at this point, uh, I think they paid, it was just over 5 million, I think, uh, to get their uh, to get their access to their network back. 
So how has this growth from their perspective been achieved? What are they doing differently? Well, one of the biggest things that they're doing is that they're adding on a, a whole lot more of hands on activity in, in conjunction with their automation tools that they have been using in the past. Very similar in a lot of ways to what JSCM group does. We are a hands on high touch organization. When we do our assessments, when we do any of our work, we actually want to automate um, as little of it as possible because every network is different and everything functions a little bit differently. You can't have the same methods for every single network. That's true on both sides of the aisle, as it were. Um, the bad guys do it because we do it. That's just what it comes down to. 42% of the ransomware attacks out there um, are attacking larger organizations. Um, they are more likely to be targeted and attacked because they're more likely to pay. That's the short version of it. Um, a smaller organization that's, you know, a couple of servers, a couple dozen desktops. Yeah, they're fine to, to start over. It's, you know, it's going to be a rough weekend for the IT department, but, um, you know, they're looking, they can, they can do that. But if you're a larger organization and you have hundreds, if not thousands of servers and tens, if not hundreds of thousands of endpoints, um, you're going to pay that money because you just don't have the time to be down for the months and months that it's going to take to get yourself back up and running. So larger organizations tend to pay more. However, smaller organizations are not left out of this. One of the things that we talk a lot about here is the uh, training as it were for, um, uh, for these attackers, you know, we use the baseball analogy a lot where, um, you know, you don't wake up one morning and decide I'm going to go play for the Mets. You know, you, you, you can't do that um, or, uh, you know, or the White Sox or something like that. You have to, you start smaller, right? Most, most of these people, you know, they, they play ball in high school and in college and then they join a minor league team and then they get to a triple A team and they can move up to, to, that, to that major league level. It's the same thing with any other kind of discipline. You don't wake up one morning and say, hey, I'm going to break into the colonial pipeline. you got to start somewhere. So smaller organizations are being targeted and hit because it allows these attackers, it gives them practice. It helps them build up their skill set. Unfortunately, being a scumbag is a skill set, and it's something you can just get better at. So who ends up being the target? for these uh, ransomware attacks. Um, these uh, percentages are the percentages of uh, the number of organizations inside of each of these verticals that, that are being targeted. Again, these are, these, are, these are surveys, these are estimated, these are not hard numbers. Obviously the attackers aren't coming out there and saying, hey, this is exactly the number of people that I'm attacking. But if you find yourself in any of these industries, um, or honestly, any other industry, to be completely honest with you, uh, these numbers are high. Um, people are going after us hard, hard when it comes to ransomware. This, this is the, the vector of attack in 2021. And the reason for that is because they can spread really quickly. You can change them really easily to get around signatures and, uh, you get, and it's extremely lucrative. It is ex exceptionally lucrative. And, um, that's what a lot of these guys are after. They're after money. Um, you know, $5 million is a lot of money is a lot of money to uh, maybe a group of 20 or 30 people that put together the ransomware attack on the colonial pipeline. Those guys, if they got away with it, they didn't get away with it. But if those guys had gotten away with it, they'd be set for life. Right. So more or less. So, um, a lot of these, uh, a lot of these attackers are going after these larger firms, you know, healthcare, education, government, because they have that kind of money. Again, do not. Do not uh, misunderstand me. Again, those smaller organizations, medium-sized organizations, they're still being attacked as well. But these are the verticals where we saw uh, that where most of the um, activity was seen. This was actually pulled from a survey from Sophos, uh, if you guys are familiar with them. So, how many people actually end up paying the money? This is really interesting, and this number actually shocked me. 32% of organizations pay the ransom. Um, we often recommend not ever paying the ransom because if you pay the ransom, you are telling your attacker, 
I will pay the ransom. <laughs> Come attack me again. Um, these guys uh, are, um, they don't have any scruples. They're clearly okay with stealing and robbing. Um, so just because you pay the ransom doesn't even guarantee that they're going to unlock your network for you or they're going to give you the keys. There's no guarantee for that. So this number actually surprised me very, very much. Um, around 57% of the rest of the attacker, uh, the rest of the people use backups to recover their data. Um, that's a, that, that's a great number. Um, I'm, you know, we're, we're, we're always happy to see, um, people, uh, properly implementing backups. Um, however, you notice that this number does not add up to 100%. You have a group of people who don't have backups or, and this is, this is what we're seeing more and more, um, had backups that were also compromised. That's something that we're seeing more and more of where ransomware is specifically targeting. It's making one of its main targets backup and recovery systems so that you can't, you know, come back up from a, a backup of your data. So what is happening when um, you get infected with ransomware? How does that get into your network and what does it do? So um, as you can see here, we've got some percentages for you. 65% of infections are delivered via phishing attacks. Phishing attacks, of course, being one of the most popular ways to try to get any kind of ransomware, malware, virus, or uh, break-in point um, to any network. Uh, phishing is scary. It's, um, uh, it's very dangerous because it's just email. Just email, and you can't stop it. You just, you, you can't, you know, unless your network just isn't going to use email anymore, there's no way to stop yourself from getting uh, a phishing email. The best thing to do is to train yourselves and to uh, yeah, undergo phishing training and make sure your users are aware. There's other methods to do as well to protect your network uh, and to protect your email specifically. Um, just because a phishing attack gets sent to you, you know, um, doesn't mean that it can't get caught and that it can't be defended against. 75% of companies infected were running up to date endpoint protection. How, how is that, you know, how is that infection rate so high then? Again, you know, a lot of this ransomware is being designed to target specific companies. Um, you're not just throwing a random uh, piece of ransomware, you know, a generic piece of ransomware at, um, at any one individual organization. You are customizing that ransomware for that organization. 34% uh, of organizations hit with ransomware took a week or more to recover their data, whether or not they do that by paying the ransom or whether or not they do that uh, from their backup. Um, you know, uh, either way, almost a third of people that are hit with ransomware take more than a week to recover that information. So that's all, you know, pretty scary sounding stuff out there, right? And 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 it is, and, and it's why we recommend um, you know, we recommend having a strong backup system, obviously strong firewall policies, um, you know, regularly having uh, testing done and uh, doing everything that you can to protect yourself. Um, more and more th these days, and we've said this before, it's not if you are going to be the target of a cyber attack, but when you're going to be the target of a cyber attack, you just need to make sure that you are as well protected as possible. And because email seems to be the primary vector that uh, these attacks are getting in from. Uh, it's the reason I wanted to bring Madison on board with us today uh, to discuss our closed port email platform. I'll turn it over to her in a minute. Um, essentially, closed port email is, if you don't know already, it's our uh, secure email protection system. We use multiple phases for email filtering. Uh, uh, we have a cloud filtering. Uh, and then a uh, and then another hardware um, filter. Um, we uh, can assure that outbound messages um, are not being spoofed. They don't contain uh, any threats. We have encryption involved in uh, closed port email, um, and it is uh, customized exactly to your needs. Um, easy setup, easy billing, um, dynamic billing. So if you go up in users, down in users, we can just change all. We can we can. Uh, do that basically on the fly. Um, we have an extremely high uptime. I can't remember the last time we were down. Um, and so it's a very stable, uh, very, very cool platform um, that uh, we're very, very proud of. And so that's why I wanted to bring Madison on um, 
she has a little bit of a chest cold, but she is still a trooper and got on the webinar with us today. Um, so I'm going to pass it over to Madison and she's going to give you, uh, she's going to give you a, uh, a little live demo for close board email. Hey, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we really appreciate any time our, our clients take out of their busy weeks. If your weeks are anything like mine, uh, your days quickly get away from you. So thank you for joining us. Like Adam said, I want to do a quick demo here of closed port email. More than anything, I want to walk you through why this is something that we feel comfortable and confident in talking about when we're talking about ransomware. As Adam said, so much ransomware now is coming across over email. It's the primary way that they're getting this content into our network. So ensuring that we have a good level of security on email coming into our environment is incredibly important. Now, there are plenty of, of uh, spam and email security systems out there, and honestly, we had looked at a bunch and felt all of them were a little lacking. We actually didn't feel like there was any one system that did everything that we wanted it to. So we came up with closed port email as a, uh, a compilation of a couple of different pieces of technology that we felt really provided us a more robust layer. So as Adam said, multiple layers of scanning, multiple layers of filtering that it's doing before it ever hits your user's inbox and completely customizable to what your needs are. So to show you a little bit of uh, the functionality of it, um, you know, uh, email systems are going to have some of, uh, they're all going to have some of the base stuff. You know, they're going to have the ability to block messages, to block from a particular user, to block from a particular domain. And so inside of the closed port email system, you've got easy access to setting that up for your domain if you're an administrator. So if you've got a message that comes through that you are alerted to, you can very easily go in and block who that's coming from. One of the other things that we put a lot of emphasis on is user quarantine. When we're talking about email, uh, a lot of people use the term spam very loosely. Spam in its actual technical meaning is a lot different than what a lot of people think of when they say the word spam. Most of the time when we say spam mail, we're actually just talking about the annoying newsletters and junk bulk messages that we get that we don't want showing up in our mailbox. So one of the things that we focus on a lot is quarantining off messages that are not being uh, or that are not malicious necessarily. We've already done the layers of scanning. We've got threat protection and AV and anti-malware that it's looking at before it ever hits our user's mailbox. So then this gives our users a little bit more of the ability to customize for themselves what their email experience looks like. So they can really decide, yes, I do need to allow this message through or I can delete that because it really is just junk. So from a user experience, we do try to make that a little bit more friendly, give them control over it. But again, we're talking about ransomware. So what are some of the things that we can do inside of this? Um, again, closed port email is something that we, we try to customize to each of our clients based off of their needs. But we do put a lot of time and effort into best practices. What are some of the things, you know, things we're seeing as we're doing testing and research from the security side of it that we can implement as part of this system. So when we're talking about setting up someone on closed for email, we have a lot of different functionality that we can put into this. We can do things like heuristic analysis and we can do things like basic AV and anti-malware. Uh, anti now this piece that we're seeing right here, this is the second layer. By the time the email would have hit this, it would have already gone through uh, AV scanning. It would have gone through an advanced threat protection service. It would have gone through uh, several other types of security before it ever hits here. One of the big things that we're seeing is impersonation. So what this means is that someone, uh, an attacker out there, pretends that there's someone trusted inside of your network. They pretend that they are the owner of the company or the president of the company or maybe your uh, your HR manager or your controller, someone who's going to elicit a bigger response than a uh, low man on the totem pole, so to speak. You know, they're going to impersonate the owner of the company, not necessarily your summer intern. So one of the things that we can do through closed port email is impersonation analysis. So what this does is allows us to target key users in the network 
So again, individuals who uh, their names are out there, their information is out there. These are the ones that the attackers are going to try and impersonate or mimic. And what we can do is we can create patterns inside of this to tell the system, here is the user's name, here is their actual email address. So if you see something else coming from someone with that name, we want to stop it. So as an example, I can put my name in here and say, all right, my, my name is Madison Slater, my email address is mslater at jfcmgroup.com. If you see someone emailing in from a Gmail address trying to say that their name is Madison Slater, we're going to stop it because that's not my actual email. So there's layers that we can do when we're talking about ransomware outside of just the, the scanning and the, the uh, intelligence piece of this. Now, one of the other things that, that we try to focus on when we're talking about closed port email is encryption. Uh, making sure that our email is secure. Talking about ransomware, we're focused more on the inbound side of things, but uh, just when we're talking about the system itself, closed port email does allow your users to send encrypted messages. And so this would look like, uh, this is what it would look like if I sent someone an encrypted email. So let's say that I'm sending a firewall configuration to someone. Uh, I'm sending an important document to our payroll company to update about a new employee. I can easily send an encrypted email. We've got several triggers that you would put into the message. The recipient receives this secure message. They have to create their identity on the system. It's going to ask them to set up their name, credentials, uh, and as part of this, it will give them access into that secure portal. So that way you can send secure content with confidence. Ransomware is something that is nasty, it's bad, and, and we look at ransomware from a lot of different aspects. Email is one of the first ways that it is going to come in, which is why we have developed closed port email. There are plenty of spam filtering solutions, there are plenty of them out there that do a good job, but again, we wanted, some, we wanted multiple layers. The reason for that is that when we're talking about things like signature-based analysis. If, that, if the signature set that we're using doesn't know that that threat exists, obviously it's not going to be able to stop it. Signatures are not the same across every platform. So by sending your email through multiple layers, we can get the analysis of different types of signatures, we can get the analysis of different types of heuristic and behavior analysis, because every system is going to look at something a little bit different. We've seen great success with rolling out closed port email, not just from a ransomware perspective, but honestly from that junk and, and, and just annoying email perspective. If email security is not something that you have reviewed recently, maybe you're running, you've been running on the same system for a couple of years, it is a good idea to, to see what's out there because you need to be keeping up with what the attackers are doing a one-for-one -one situation. Outside of closed port email, when we're talking about, uh, when we're talking about the, the threats that are there, as Adam said, focusing on user training is highly, highly important. Your users are only as skilled as you teach them to be. You have to teach them what to look out for. Closed port email is a great system. I stand behind it. I have it protecting our users' email. I still train my users on what to look for. No system is 100%, especially when we're talking about ransomware. And we will never tell you that our system is 100%. We would be liars. Anyone out there who tells you that their system is 100%, they're not telling the truth. You still need to focus on training your users. You need to tell them what to look out for. And you need to have a process in place if something happens. It's not if, it's when. It's not if we get hit by ransomware, it's when. When that malicious email comes through, we have to think about it in the worst case scenario. Hopefully it never happens. Hopefully we are in the if situation, but we have to consider the when. We've had many clients over the years have to face that reality that ransomware got into their network. So you need to have procedures in place for how to handle that. Email security is one of the first steps that you should be taking into consideration, but you also need to think about how you're training your users what your process is, if it does get inside, do you know who to contact? Do you know what steps you're going to be taking? Do you have a good backup? Do you have a good disaster recovery plan? 
those are the things that you need to be having conversations about internally. And if you don't know how to have those conversations, it's part of the reason we put these webinars on. We are a resource to every single one of you. We don't like getting those, those calls that our clients have gotten hit by ransomware. It sends us into a panic as well. So if you, if you are concerned about your current state of your email, of your user understanding, please reach out to us. We'll be happy to assist. And with that, Adam, I will turn it back over to you. Great. Thank you, Madison. Uh, we always appreciate it when uh, you can when you can uh, come on these and and uh, show us uh, show us a cool solution. So uh, before we get to the questions, let's you know all this ransomware stuff is kind of dour. Let's talk about a fun thing. Um, we've got a fun event coming up actually next week. Um, or oh my gosh, not next week. It's it's in two days. It's in Alpharetta, Georgia. I know it's a little bit last minute, but it's at the uh, Jekyll Brewing Company uh, in Alpharetta. If you're in the area, we would love to have you come by. You can go ahead and register for that event at uh, www.jscmgroup.com slash Jekyll-Brewing. Uh, you can see that link right there uh, on the page. Um, or if you just go to our website, you can go to the events page and you can see it there. Uh, we're giving away a free external penetration test and we're giving away a hundred dollar gift card. Um, so, yeah, so uh, we hope to see you guys there. It'll honestly, we're just kind of hanging out. We're talking. Um, we're going to, uh, you know, uh, just want to meet some of you guys and hang out and chat. So have a couple brews. It'll be good. Good time. All right. I'm going to go ahead and open it up there to questions. Um, if you have a question, you can go ahead and you can send it in. It's in that. Uh, on that right hand side chat window, um, you know, uh, again, you know, I know this is a, this is a heavy topic. There's a, there's, there's a lot of stuff out there right now and it's dangerous and, you know, we need to be, we need to be aware of it. Um, again, it's not, if it's when, and it's doing everything that we can to protect ourselves. 1 of the things that, you know, there's that, there's that old joke that, um, you don't have to swim faster than a shark. You just have to swim faster than the guy next to you. Um, that's actually really true when it comes to cybersecurity. Um, you just got to make yourself a harder target than people around you and attackers will get bored and move on. Um, if, if you're too difficult to, to attack, it's going to act, you know, heck with this. I'm, I'm going to go attack somebody else. Um, and that's, I mean, honestly, that's, that's the key to it. Um, is to just be enough of a pain in the butt that, uh, that nobody, uh, wants to, um, Nobody wants to bother with it. Uh, I don't think we had any questions, uh, which is fine. Um, but if you do have any questions, if anything comes up and you have questions for Madison or I, our contact information is here up on the page. Um, you can reach us directly by phone or by email. Um, or if you've got a contact with somebody else here at JSCM group, like Kevin or Sue or, or somebody else that you have further questions on, please feel free to reach out to them as well. All right, guys, I'm going to let you go for lunch uh, if, you're, if you're on the East Coast. Uh, and, yeah, if you're down in the Atlanta Alpharetta area, we really hope to see you on Thursday. Um, everyone have a fantastic day, and we'll talk to you soon.